Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 255. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the man himself, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. Good morning, listeners. Good morning, members. Boy, are we bringing to the culmination, Mike, a fantastic series that I personally have thoroughly enjoyed, and I'm sure our listeners as well as the Moonshots family have as well. But it's quite a sad moment, isn't it, for uh, our Seth Godin series coming to a close? I don't know. We're we're taking such a radical turn in his books today, Mark. I, I think uh, people will have no time for disappointment, rather curiosity and interest. Curiosity and interest is exactly what we try and bring all of our listeners and members every single week. And boy, Seth Godin himself doesn't disappoint on this occasion either, because winners really are, Mike, the best quitters. We are digging into Seth Godin's book, The Dip, a little book that teaches you when to quit and when to stick. Now, Mike, when we dug into this, and this is the third in our series on Seth Godin, I think we've always been impressed with his ability to, let's say, call out and help us understand different points of view, uh, understand the status quo a little bit better and notice whether that's in line with the way that we want to live, exist, work and so on. But this one, particularly for me, had such a volume. It's a very small book, actually, but it had such a volume in the way that we were preparing for this show. I, I can't wait to get started. What, what did it mean to you digging into this book? Well, you know, the... What's really interesting is that we, first of all, we did two of his like most famous marketing books. So it's all about business and products and selling your idea. Mm-hmm. And now we take a dip into the journey, almost the hero's journey on what it takes to actually build something of value, whether it's a project, a community, or a business. What's really interesting about the dip is Seth comes at it from a totally different Point of view because it's almost at, at at face value it's it's almost conflicting with resilience of David Goggins or the grit of Angela Duckworth. He's sort of proposing like, oh, you need to know when you're going to hit the emergency cord, and it's a little counterintuitive to Moonshot's thinking because we've always put such an emphasis on resilience staying disciplined, going the long path, taking full and extreme ownership. But actually, you know, you can talk about this dip as being two things. It's something that makes sure that you are on the way to mastery and it's a necessary step. But also this idea of quitting and sticking is really a different way of saying making good choices. Mm. So all of our listeners who are trying to tackle the question, am I working on the right things? Am I going in the right direction? This book is so perfect. And for anyone who wants to reflect on their vision, their purpose, their values, and see how that manifests in every single day, this is also the book for you. So Seth's pulling it like so many rabbits out of the hat here, Mark. I can't wait to jump in. Yeah, me, me neither. I think that's the perfect introduction, Mike. I don't think I can even build upon that. So maybe we can go straight into our first clip, which is Seth Godin himself having a chat with Suzwati Basu on why successful people quit. Why do you think it's important to quit things in order to be the best? So here's what we got trained to do. And you're not from where I'm from. I went to school in the States near uh, Buffalo, which is near four hours, six hours from New York City, um, we got trained to not quit. That there's a lot of applause for people who stick it out, who persist. But guess what? Successful people quit all the time. That if you took ballet lessons when you were three, you're not a ballerina now. Sometime between then and now, you quit ballet so that you could learn to play the flute. And then you quit learning to play the flute so you could learn to be a better partner or whatever you chose to put your energy into. And what I believe is that if we're going to do anything professional, meaning we're asking someone else in the world to trade something of value for it, showing up and saying to someone, well, I'm very, very busy and I'm working on lots of things. This is the best I could do. Isn't particularly generous. Instead, what we could do is say, I've tried to have empathy for you and what you need. I tried to see the world through your eyes. And based on that, I have given up lots of other things I could be doing and put the effort into this one thing that here in this moment is the thing that you really want. 
And the fact is someone else is doing that. And if you don't do that, that person's going to get the sale you're looking for, the connection that you seek. So what we have to do is say, you know what? I can't simultaneously be a great pediatric nurse, be a great nuclear engineer, and be a great politician. Because if I try to do all three of those things, I'm going to be mediocre at all three, as opposed to being really good at the thing that I'm going to commit to. Mm, this question of quitting, do you notice mm. like how it does sound like a capitulation when you say it? Like it's it's loaded with that kind of feeling, isn't it? Yeah, I, I find the word quit is uh, still quite uncomfortable. You know, whether you are, whether that's personal opinion or we, even when you're reading articles and so on online, it's often a little bit in a, of an uncomfortable word. And I think that's okay, though, because what I found quite insightful from Seth when we dug into this book is he's making it more obvious to me about the volume of times in my life that I have prioritized and deprioritized things that then enable me to go out and as we've got on the behind us for those watching trading value value being my time my effort if i want to give my all to say the moonshots podcast well i'm not going to go out and drink all day <laughs> or i'm not going to go out and do something a little bit uh, more distracting mark are you, you know, saying I that will... you've turned up to all these episodes sober i always thought you had been out drinking all day <laughs> I don't want to reveal too much, clearly. Okay. Okay. But uh, but I think that that insight for me is, uh, again, about this big word, this buzzword of prioritization. Am I spending the right volume of my time on the things that really matter to me? And if I've got things in my life that actually get in the way of that and hamper it, I should look at maybe stopping it and said better, quitting. Yeah, and, and, and I think that... Um... To put this, I think, in situations that many of our listeners, viewers, and members may see for themselves, when I hear this, I, I hear about trying to be too many things to too many people and doing none of them very well, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, uh, an example of what comes to my mind, and I wish I'd had the dip earlier, is that, you know, for for over 30 years now, I've really been into – house music, dance music, and DJing. And I have consoles and, and all of that kind of kit. But because of my workload and my commitment to the things that I create outside of music, at the moment, I haven't DJed for probably a year plus now, just because I have a lot going on. That was something I needed to quit for a while because I knew – on the last mix that I made some 15, 16 months ago, it was really hard work. It was a bit rushed and I wasn't that happy with the mix. And I knew that I was just trying to do too much. So I needed to yeah. go through a process. And what's really funny, Mark, is I had to go through a real process of quitting and saying, that's okay. You, I was trying to have like all these podcasts or these DJs mm, have my mm. own company, travel the world, work with clients, be a dad, be a son, be yeah. a husband. I'm like, it's a kind of this, oh, by the way, I ran a marathon too. Don't mention that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So the thing here is the value was all, all wrong in that equation and I needed to quit. And I, I found it very hard because, you know, I try not to be a quitter. Mm. But actually, I needed to make choices. I need to make needed to make priorities, and I think focus. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of us, I think you and me, and a lot of our listeners, Mark, are trying to be the best they can be in many different areas. And I think what's important is we learnt something very, very primary with Albert Einstein. Because he said, I am no smarter than anybody else. I just thought about the one problem for yeah. longer than anybody else. Yeah. I think if we yeah. look at ourselves, you know, being a generalist can be very effective in, in many different areas. But at some point, you have to go deep. You have to go deep on something. Yeah. You have to pursue the mastery yeah. of something. And I think we're often trying to be so many things and 
perhaps to too many other people other than to ourselves, that we end up pleasing no one because we are not mastering anything and we feel somewhat unfulfilled. So Mm. this is where I think this idea from Seth really comes to play, knowing that successful people quit. We might say this as a mantra is that successful people make choices, make sacrifices, prioritize. I think it's all the same Mm. thing in the end. What do you think? Yeah, look, I I completely agree with a lot of that. I, I there are times in my life when <clears throat> upon reflection, yeah, maybe I could have stuck things out for longer had I had the foresight of the duration of the dip. But fundamentally, the things that I have deprioritized. Well, let's use a light one, surfing. Surfing is a, a sport that, yeah, I, I I've tried to get into. I I like swimming, so it appeals to me. It's out in the sun. However, I can't stand it. Very, very challenging, and it's quite frustrating. So for me, instead of deprioritizing something else in order to give myself the time to get better at surfing, I know in my heart of hearts, I just don't enjoy it that much. So having to think about it, yeah, would I like to be able to do it? Sure. Am I going to spend all that time to do it? No. I'd rather put it into something else. And you're right. Somebody like Albert Einstein, he wasn't also running marathons. Right. You know, it's going to be something that he would have made that choice, much like James Dyson. He would have made the choice over, you know, spending the time in his shed over something else other than so, that, because he so, knew in his heart of hearts he wanted to get it. So check this out. So when I ran the marathon um, two years ago, last year, I just ran the 10K, right? Mm. Because I didn't have the time. I was traveling. But you know what was amazing is I ran it with my son. It was the first time we'd ever done a really long run together. We did the 10K, and we're doing it again together this year. And so it's turned out to be a great win. But giving yourself permission to quit when you're like, hey, I can't be everything to everyone. I can't be trying to be Superman in everything I do because I end up doing nothing well. And I think that that's a huge insight. But I think something that we can always know that we're going to do well, Mark, and that is being a member of the Moonshots podcast. I I totally agree. We've got a bunch of people, Mike, that I think do not have the permission to quit. (laughs) They are our lifelong uh, supporters. They should totally ignore They should totally ignore this, Jordan. (laughs) Ignore this book, everybody. This whole show, just ignore Uh, it. (laughs) <laughs> but in all seriousness, I think all these individuals, I think, are like-minded as you and I, Mike. So I hope, please, without further ado, blah, 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 welcome in the individuals who are behind the Moonshots podcast. Bob, Ken, Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, Lisa, and Sid, Mr. Bonjour, Paul, Bergen, Kalman, Joe, Christian, Samuel, and Barbara, Andre, Chris, Deborah, Lasse, Steve, Craig, Daniel, and Andrew, Ravi, Yvette, Karen, Raul, Nikawada, Ingram, Dirk, and Harry, Venkata, Marco, Jet, Roger, Steph, Gabi, Aurora, Nimelen, James, Wade, Christoph, Denise, and Teresa. A few of you guys have just gone over the annual membership. So, an extra toot of the horn for you guys. Thank you again for your ongoing support of the Moonshots podcast. But hot on those heels are Laura, Smitty, Corey, and Gayla. Bertram, Daniela, Mike and Dan, Antonio, Zachary, Austin and Fred, Lorenz, Ola, Andy, Diana, Margie, Chris and our brand new member, Ron. Thank you so much, Ron, as well as for all of our members for supporting the Moonshots podcast. We are certainly very grateful. So thank you to all of you. And don't forget, you get that fabulous Moonshot Master Series, a whole other podcast. So if you're into that, head over to moonshots.io, hit the big member button and your life will never be the same. I'll tell you what, (laughs) this idea of knowing when to quit, when to focus and to make choices, we've opened it up, but I think we need to close the deal here, Mike. I think we need to go and double click and zoom in here and actually figure out there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. Yeah, I totally agree. So we've got a great clip from Productivity Game, one of our favorites. He's going to provide us a little bit more information, Mike, a little bit more guidance around this idea of limits and when to quit. When a smart investor purchases a stock, he or she puts a stop loss limit on their purchase, a condition that if met will cause them to automatically sell their stock and accept the loss. Unless there is a fundamental change in the market, the investor will remain committed to their investment until the predefined exit condition is met. This prevents them from panicking, exiting the position early and missing out on substantial returns. Before you invest in a dip, you need to do the same. 
Ultra marathoner Dick Collins once said, Decide before the race the conditions that will cause you to stop and drop out. You don't want to be out there saying, Well, gee, my leg hurts, I'm a little dehydrated, I'm sleepy, I'm tired, and it's cold and windy. And talk yourself into quitting. If you are making a decision based on how you feel at that moment, you will probably make the wrong decision. To avoid making rash decisions and throwing away previous effort, you need to determine your limits before entering a dip. How much time are you willing to spend? How much money are you willing to lose? How much pain are you willing to go through before quitting? With those limits in mind, you need to make a quitting contract with yourself and vow to not quit unless you go beyond those limits or something fundamental changes. With a quitting contract in place, you can calmly face panic and setback by asking yourself, have my predefined quitting conditions been met? No. Has something fundamental changed? No. Okay, then I need to stick with it. Oh, Mark, I'm just hydrating because I'm getting ready to do the <laughs> marathon of quitting here. So, so here's the yeah. thing. I, I think what would be interesting if we play a game where mm-hmm. I'm going to use a sports metaphor and you use mm-hmm. a business metaphor of when and when we when we do and don't quit. Okay, so let's take uh, the the running thing. Let's say you're preparing for a um, marathon and you, you need to know like, okay, when am I pushing too hard? Right. Mm-hmm. So I think like if you go out for a, if you set the 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 alarm for a five thirty wake up and you're like, oh, this is too hard. I think you need to pre-agree with yourself. Look, of course I'm going to resist it because I never get up at 5.30 because I never run. I usually get mm. up at 7. So I, I'm, I'm prepared. It's going to be hard to get up at 5.30 uh, a.m., but I know that it's mm. okay, right? Yeah. Likewise, if you start jogging and you're starting your early run program and you feel really out of breath, hot and bothered, um, you're running very slow, do you quit then? No, you just know mm-hmm. that you're mm-hmm. building up some cardiovascular health, right? Yeah. You're building yeah. up your fitness. Now, those are very clear things that you can say, I don't quit just because I'm really hot, right? Yeah. I don't yeah. quit because it's cold outside, right? You can come out mm-hmm. with all these clear lines. I think naturally mm-hmm. what you can do is if after running the following day, you literally are so sore you cannot work, I think you need to quit for a day and recover, right? I think if you're having (laughs) heart palpitations and irregular (laughs) heartbeats, maybe you do need to consider quitting, and those are clear lines you can make. But I think what the beauty is is thinking these through beforehand, thinking these through as pre-agreements of when you do and don't quit because the thing is, and I know this from running, because I had such a commitment to running the marathon that there was just no way. I I felt in the last, you know, I'd run 35, 37 Ks. I had five Ks to go. I'd been running for like four hours and I'd never run for four hours before in my life. Mm-hmm. But I knew somewhere deep inside me, I was so all about just finishing. I was going to keep running the whole way. None of this, like people were bailing and walking and, you know, all that. Uh, no, nah, just keep going, keep going, keep going. That when you make these sorts of commitments and contracts, there's, you're in this constant temptation in the last five miles, the last five kilometers mm-hmm. of a marathon of why am I doing this? Maybe I should just stop. But having this pre agree arrangement, look, I'm not dead. I'm like, I'm beat but I'm not dead. This is not doing me like irreparable harm. And I think this is really, really important. If you set those things, you can actually discover you've got so much more potential, but also you Mm. have to listen to say, hey, I've woken up today and I'm really severely bad. Like I think I need to go to ER, my body's so sore from running, or I'm having (laughs) irregularities on heartbeat, breath, that sort of stuff. Then those are clear signals that you don't keep going. So, Mm. Mark, let's now put it into something that perhaps more of us face, which is a work situation. I want you to kind of play this game with me, like walk me through a situation that's challenging and can Mm. you give us your guideposts of when you do and don't? Mm. Yeah, I think business – uh, to con- is kind of like a marathon to a certain extent. You, you're training yourself. And what I mean by that is you're getting 
like we say a lot on the show, you're getting comfortable being uncomfortable sometimes. And business is exactly like a marathon, isn't it? So it's a good analogy. I think when there's times in business the where you're kind of questioning, hmm, is something not right here? Can I really be bothered? It comes down to time. You know, maybe you're asked to join an evening call or maybe you're asked to join, um, you know, a call each week. I think that would be a moment for me that you'd, you know, question, okay, is this something I'm going to quit over? Well, probably not, because realistically, it's not my full job. I'm not going to work evening shifts every single night. Instead, it's fair that occasionally I might need to collaborate with other team members or it's going to benefit me because I am speaking to somebody in a different time zone. I'm going to absorb their knowledge. That's good for me. So rather, so having that wisdom and having, what was the word you said? Oh, the potential. Having that insight and that wisdom and knowing the potential that can benefit you from investing just a little bit more time outweighs the idea of just quitting straight away. Okay. Likewise. So, so hang on. So let me see if I follow it. So you're saying... Maybe I'm jumping too far. Like if on occasion the company says to you, could you join a call at 8 p.m.? You're like, okay. Mm. But if they say every night you're on a call at 8 p.m., you're like, no way, because that means my day's way too long. Is that is that kind of where you go? I, I, I would go to even more of the extreme. If your work becomes against your um, your time zone, let's say, you know, you get asked to only do night shifts, let's say. And it becomes difficult for you to balance work, life, family, the other priorities, again, to use this word of ours. When you start to notice the priorities that you have around you that are contributing to you being that best version of yourself, mm-hmm. you know, the happy version, the curious version, uh, you know, maybe it's getting in the way of our listeners and members being able to listen to the Moonshots podcast. If work is becoming like that, then you need to realize and really consider, is this uh, volume of time that I'm dedicating to the job worth it? That for me would be uh, an indication that I would then want to reflect upon. Likewise, when it comes to you know responsibilities with the job, maybe you're getting asked to do a presentation. Maybe you're getting asked to do a conversation that you're not really comfortable doing. Again, those things are not, in my opinion, uh, alarm bells that then would say, okay, you know what? I'm going to quit. I don't want to have this conversation. I don't want to learn how to do it because ultimately it'll contribute to you positively. You know, if the task that you're being asked to do, I think will uh, benefit you in the long run, maybe give you experience, confidence, um, maybe the ability to get up in front of people a little bit better because you've had to do it. That's the discomfort that can benefit you. Yes. If you're the job's not going to pay you, That's not benefiting you. If they're going against your beliefs, you know, whether it's beliefs around behavior or otherwise, that doesn't, that seems like a red flag because suddenly you're being asked to go against you as an individual and that's not benefiting you. So great examples of that would be if the company is asking you to do something, let's say your boss is asking you to do something, you should ask, have you done this before to the boss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put them, put them on put the spot. That's like they, would, would they actually do mm. it themselves? Yeah, um, that's another, interesting. I think another thing is when people are making commitments together, um, I think a really important thing is if someone is asking you to promise, let's say to a client, promising them an outcome that you know is risky, then I think – the when to know when you quit and when you don't quit, you, you should say, hey, I, I really feel like we should disclose the risk associated with it. It's possible what we're promising. However, you know, there's quite a lot of risk we would need to manage and a lot of challenges for that to happen. And if your if your organization doesn't want to disclose that to the to the third party, that's mm. starting to get into the area where you need to like reevaluate, is this somewhere I can work and live by my values? Obviously, if they're outright saying just promise them the world and it's never going to happen, that's like massive red flag. But I think that one's pretty easy for everyone. I think it's the stuff in the middle, and I think it's all mm. about the full disclosure. And and I think that when you're in a place where you're working with people and people are making commitments and communication, I think it's all about 
the risks associated, the conditions, the prerequisites for certain things to happen. Because a lot of people end up saying things like, well, you didn't tell me this at the time, right? (laughs) Mm, Yeah. So I think it's always like put yourself on the other foot. If you were Mm. getting someone promising you, what would you need to know to be comfortable? Because I think a lot of us would be happy to go ahead knowing the full risk. What just kills us is when we don't know. So I think there's some techniques to use here, which is if the work that you're doing is in line with the vision you have of yourself, perhaps your purpose, but also your values. If you want to act with integrity, then you should really disclose things fully and completely, particularly when we're in gray areas, right? You shouldn't present them as being black and white, right? You know, we will deliver you 101 widgets tomorrow when you're like, well, it could be 90 depending on the weather, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. It's transparency, isn't it? And I've obviously harked back to the Crucial Conversations episode a few times on the show. But I think this book and where Seth is taking us here reminds me of that. You know, he's inviting us to be reflective, to be transparent, Hmm. to be honest with ourselves. I think the moments, and exactly as we heard in that first clip, the moments when I think people find themselves really questioning whether they should quit, it kind of goes against uh, your standard behavior because it is that fight or flight. Right. You know, and and than, you know when you're feeling fight or flight is a terrible moment to make decisions because you're emotionally geared, not rationally geared, which mm-hmm. is why, like, you know, we're going to get into this, like constantly reaffirming your values and the vision and the purpose you have of yourself makes it so mm-hmm. much easier because when you're in the dip, you're able to go, you know what, it's just the dip, I can grind this out. Yeah. But there are other times when you're like, "Uh, this doesn't feel good at all. Like I'm not Mm. in a place that's making it easy for me to act the way I believe I should be acting. Mm. Or I'm doing stuff that is like so not in line with the vision and my purpose in life. Mm. You know, I want to go left and the whole business is going right completely at Mm. a hard right Mm. angle. (laughs) So, okay, obviously things are not meant to be. But I think – The key to the idea in this clip is that you should always be setting your limits, right, Mm, mm. before you go, before you run the race, before you go to training, right? No, Mm. like, hey, it's going to be hard. I could be really, really sore for the first couple of weeks as I build up that muscle group. Or mm. I'm starting in a new company. I'm learning everything afresh. It's going to be weird and awkward. I'm not just going to bail yeah. just because I'm like, wow, this is a bit overwhelming. Yeah. Because mm. it could be overwhelming, but you're like, the people are nice. I love what they're trying to do. Yeah. I can see myself flourishing here, right? Yeah. If you can yeah. truly a- articulate how this can lead to your, you actually achieving your purpose, great. Mm. But if you can't, mm. you know, the sirens should should definitely be going. Yeah. And I think, Mark, what happens is we get into situations, we haven't got our values and our vision f- figured mm. out, and stuff's flying all over the place. We're in the we're in the middle of heavy artillery fire and we can't make a sensible decision. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the the invitation that I think Seth's giving us here is something I wish I'd known, you know, previously, Mike. You know, had for any new occasion, whether it's a new job, project, um, friendship, relationship, whatever it might be, I think this idea of a, of a contract and making yourself accountable to uh, – and, and it's a little bit like what Jordan Peterson might have said um, about holding yourself accountable by talking about it with others, but a little bit more direct perhaps down the run, holiday route uh, with journaling and and reflecting on ourselves and and meditating perhaps is more accurate, you can then, uh, I would then benefit from that because then you might stay that little bit longer. Oh my. If you know, right? (laughs) You know, we've spoken about times when we quit. Yeah. Without hindsight and that insight, it would be so much uh, more valuable. So, Mark, I mean – I want you to do this exercise. How many things did you quit too early and how many things did you not quit soon enough in life because you were lost in the heavy artillery of life? (laughs) Mm, Yeah, yeah.
How funny is that? And, you know, again, that reminds me, and we spoke about this before the show, Daniel Pink, yeah. The Power of Regret. Yeah. You know, I think, again, what's the superpower that Seth is helping us understand today with the dip is take ownership, look at your behavior and how you react to situations, hold yourself accountable, and don't put yourself in a position where later down the line you might regret it. Yeah. Because you can't go back. Time, <laughs> you know, as we, as we know, is all you have. That's yeah. the value that you can provide. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Um, before we get into this next idea of the, the curvature of the dip, I want to remind all of our listeners, our viewers, and our members that this is the third part of the Seth Godin series. So if you're interested in his other episodes that we have done, head over to moonshots.io, check them all out, and you'll find just a mm. cool 250 other shows there as well. But Mark, what's with this dip thing and uh, what's with the curves in the dip? Yeah, you know, we've heard this idea of fluctuation, you know, we're in the dip, maybe there's a hero's journey, we're going up and down, left and right. Let's hear now a little bit more of a breakdown, this time from Mentally Fit Book Club, who's going to help us understand the curves within Seth's book and the definitions behind the dip, a cul-de-sac and a cliff. Let's talk about what Seth calls the curves that define the situations we face. First, let's talk about the dip. The dip is the long slog between starting and mastery. Here's what the dip looks like. Initially, trying something new is fun and you see results quickly. Then you reach the dip, right here. The dip is the chasm between mediocrity and success. Getting through it requires hard work and dedication. For example, if you want to master a skill, if you want to be truly remarkable, you have to push through the dip. You have to persevere. Now, let's talk about the cul-de-sac. The cul-de-sac is a situation where you work and you work and you work and nothing much changes. It doesn't get a lot better. It doesn't get a lot worse. Here's what it looks like. It's a long and painfully uneventful trudge that never pays off. A cul-de-sac is a dead end. It's a path to nowhere. It's a waste of your time, your effort, and your talent. But it feels safe, so people stick with it. It's the job a person refuses to quit, or the path a person refuses to abandon, even when they know they should. Almost every situation we face can be defined as either a dip or a cul-de-sac. However, Seth tells us about one more curve, a bonus curve he calls the cliff. The cliff is a quasi-curve. It's not really a curve. It's a situation where you can't quit until you fall off and the whole thing falls apart. It's a path to disaster. Here's what the cliff looks like. The cliff is a situation where you get a little reinforcement for your effort over time until one day the music stops and the party is over. You get the same disastrous result as the cul-de-sac, but the cliff has a much more dramatic ending. Mark, I, this is like a map that we yeah. all need because like I'm thinking this through like the cul-de-sacs and the dead ends mm. and the dips. I think we spend yeah. so much time trying to like wake up and realize which one are we in and we have no <laughs> guideposts and no signs and roads and we're like where am i is this good yeah. stop start continue spin 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 stress out uncertainty mm -hmm. resistance like a bunch of stuff is going on there right yeah big time i mean you're exactly right knowing i i've been in situations mike when let's call it the cul-de-sac you're in that job and you can think Oh, this is this is safe. That's easy. I've been in that situation, but I've never really considered how uh, uh, potentially detrimental it can be. You know, because safety is attractive, as we know from the brain. You don't necessarily want too much resilience. So actually, the cul-de-sac approach kind of goes against, I think, the moonshots message really, which is which is a fascinating uh, breakdown from Seth. Likewise, for me, with the cliff that feels like you can see. The, the nightmare in sight. Maybe it's because of your colleagues. Maybe you've seen like-minded individuals come and go. Maybe the company's destined to fail or whatever the action is, you're destined to fail. What a fantastic little blueprint 
that helps us really challenge where we are in that journey. Oh, totally. Right? So I guess the big question is, Mark, how do we know, how do you know when you, you're in each of those? Can you give us an example of when you feel like, oh, it's clear to me I'm in each one of those? Yeah, I think if we start with the dip, knowing that new fun, new stuff is fun. So let's say it's a new hobby or a new job, knowing that it gonna, it's going to become hard in order to become a master at something. Look, I've, I've done this dozens of times. I, I learned Mandarin for a couple of years. I passed, you know, some essential exams. I was, I was okay. But then I got to a point where that dip took place. It became just a little bit too hard for me to see any more change. I could have increased the volume of time. I could have increased, you know, the attention I gave it. But instead, I thought, you know what, that's, that's probably enough. That was the dip. That's when I noticed, you know what, here I, here I come and, and I, I pulled the ripcord. But with hindsight, maybe that was actually a cliff because I was putting in all that effort. And yep. realistically, if I considered what is the end destination, am I going to go and live in China? Am I going to benefit from having Mandarin in my language skills because it's so, such a huge volume of time? Probably not. So therefore, if I had had a, a blueprint similar to Seth's uh, angles and curves, I probably could have anticipated that and maybe gone out and done Spanish or yes. yeah. French or whatever it might, or Australian, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know you'd need news for that. Let, I'm going to share yeah. a little visual with you right now. So for all of our viewers, you can tune into mm -hmm. this. I think this is really interesting because what it does is it's basically showing the effort reward, and this is almost like the playbook or the roadmap that we were just talking about. So basically, if you are continuing to put in effort, but you see no change in the rewards, like over months and months, like the rewards mm. are plateaued, that looks like the cul-de-sac. The cliff is they ramp up real quick, but then they just drop off completely that mm. is the cliff now the dip never stands still what you can see here on the far left is the dip has this undulating kind of like highlands kind of uh, curvature but at some point and it doesn't take too long the effort ask matches the rewards, meaning mm. that actually you see this tail, as you can see on the screen here, like it really ramps in that second half. Mm. So I think when you are consistently seeing no change in your rewards, that's a warning sign that you're in a cul-de-sac of going nowhere. The cliff yeah. is when you have seen a radical and immediate downturn in rewards in what you're doing, that's another huge flag. If you've seen a reduction in rewards, but they've not completely disappeared and you see some movement there, chances are you might be in the dip. Mm -hmm. If only we had this 40 years ago, Mark, this would have yeah. solved so much drama for me. I know. So, Mike, as, as we reflect on these curves, and I, I liked how you called out the dip is undulating and it never it, it never changes. Right. Oh, sorry, it's always changing. I like I think that's a key difference actually to call out. What can you imagine? What can we both imagine? Are typical rewards, for example, when you're on the dip yeah. and the rewards go down. Oh. Satisfaction with work. Oh, I'll go. I'll go to the big one. Rate of learning. Learning. When you, yeah. When you're not learning. Yeah. When you're not having aha moments, oh, huh, mm. I didn't know that moments, and it's just none of that, I think mm. we all will mm. eventually get very bored. Um, yeah. So I think it's the absence of learning because absence of learning is the absence of growth, and the absence of growth, Mark, is the absence of satisfaction that you mentioned. Yes, that's it. I agree. I think, you know, more um, visually or, or another uh, reward would be that sense of satisfaction. You're right, sense of satisfaction comes really from learning. Yep. I think so does the ability to collaborate with others for me. I know that's a product because, of- Because you're learning. You're learning new yeah. stuff from new people, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
collect, they, exactly, that exposure to others. So what a fascinating but easy to understand equation from Seth. Yeah. You know, he's going back to that first clip that we heard, this idea of trading value. Yes. Now seeing that visualized, how simple, I yes. dare say, <laughs> is it all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that this exchange of value going out into the world, creating things that matter, selling ideas, getting people on board with how you see it mm. is all part of it. And in fact, this last clip from Seth talks about that very thing. That's right. We're going to hear from Seth one final time in Mike, this current series on Seth Godin. This time he's closing out the uh, show as well as the series with Selling Power. And this time we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the dip and understand how we hold ourselves accountable. So the dip is just before the rise comes, right? Well, here's what happens. In almost any area of endeavor, only a tiny percentage can win, right? Only one person can win the race. Only three companies can be the biggest three companies in their industry. Only one search engine can be the one that people choose to go to. So what happens when you set out to do almost anything is there's excitement and energy and enthusiasm at the beginning. At the beginning, people will try you because you're new. And then inevitably, the dip hits. The dip is the screen, the filter, the thing that separates the triers from the winners. The dip is organic chemistry. If you set out to be a doctor, first you're pre-med. And the thing that happens in the middle of pre-med is you have to take organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is the course that separates everybody from the people who get into med school. And that's good news. The dip is actually a good thing. Because if it weren't for organic chemistry, everyone would be a doctor. So and if organic... everyone would be a doctor, it wouldn't be worth anything. It's an organic selection process. Exactly. And so as a salesperson, there's all this hazing that goes on when you call on IBM, or all these problems that you go on when you're trying to get a great job at Xerox, or all these things you have to do that separate the insiders from the outsiders. Now, as a salesperson my whole life, I've cursed out those moments because you say, if I could just have that connection to that person, if I could just be in that RFP list, if I could just be on the short list, then I'd be fine. But in fact, the dip is your friend because once you get through it, once you get to the other side, that's where the profits come from. Hmm. Now, mm. this is where he brings it home because, Mark, what he's basically saying, for all this talk of quitting, mm. he's actually saying, Here's what to focus on and here's what not to quit because on the other side of the 10,000 hours, on the other side of the grind and the uncertainty and the valley of darkness, mm. the dip yeah. is all the good stuff because most people in life, when they hit the dip, they bail. Yeah. Big time. What he's really yeah. talking to is, well, when do you stick with it and when do you don't? And that mm. nuance, it's so subtle. <laughs> but that's well, everything, right? Look, I, I think a, a visual uh, demonstration of that point, Mike, would be the the Moonshot Show. Mm. You know, as you've called out before, fifty percent of podcasts uh, uh, disappear within ten episodes, and then the other remaining fifty percent is then cut again after you know twenty episodes or whatever it was. And so, what you're left with is a very, very sm uh, in comparison, at least from the volume of people that start down to the people that continue. It just comes down to that sustained effort that then separates the people who want to go out and do it and the people that thought about doing it but couldn't really be bothered. You know, and it's the same with a lot of jobs. It's the same with uh, even getting a visa in Australia. They make it system, they make the process quite difficult and probably quite easy to quit. But because it's difficult, it means that the people who get it all the way through, really hey, want it. good news. Well done, you've done it. Yep. And it feels satisfactory. It's a great feeling, as well as, you know, the fact that the selection process has taken place. So what an interesting build, right? So I believe that most people deeply want to do things that make them feel fulfilled and satisfied. I believe mm -hmm. most people want to have an impact on the people around them, positive impact. Mm -hmm. I believe everybody wants to leave some sort of legacy. What they don't know is this whole secret of there are dips for sure. And you need to know when to stick and when to quit. And we find ourselves sometimes abandoning too early or waiting too late. And this gives us the playbook to get through, Mark. 
invaluable book, right? Wow. I mean, it's kind of like learning how to play um, 21. You know, do I stick or do I twist? Right. Or do I double? It's when it's the knowing when to double down. And that for me, Mike, when I think back to my career, this is going to probably be one of those books that I will gift to people who might be struggling because it's a great reminder to stick at it if you really, really want it. And more often than not, I think a lot of us end up quitting maybe too early than we probably should at yeah. certain things. Um, so what a wonderful way to be held accountable again by old Seth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it really is so good. And the fact that we got so much from his marketing series as well. So from all of these big, dippy, curvy ideas, Mark, which one is going to get a bit of extra attention from you? Well, I, I, I love the visualization of the curves. I think that's going to be quite an easy uh, uh, blueprint to bear in mind. So I think that's probably going to be my uh, take home insight today, noticing where I might be, whether it's a new job or whatever it might be, and seeing that path ahead of me, making sure that I'm not, you know, taking myself down the wrong one. That's, I think, something I can take away and, and actively work on. What about you, Mike? Four big ideas from the start, uh, from the uh, from the book today. Look, I'm totally with you. It was that that deep mm. cul-de-sac cliff, knowing yeah. those different curves. That was amazing. Yeah, me too. Me too. I think actually, before we recorded, I thought it would be another one, but actually, that was a, a particularly valuable visualization. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Well, Mark, thank you to you and thank you to you, our listeners, viewers, and members joining us here on show 255, where we explored The Dip by Seth Godin himself, the third and last installment of our Seth Godin series. And we learned four big ideas. Successful people do actually quit. The key thing is, though, idea number two, they know when to quit. And they know that when they look at the tapestry and the typography, the curvature of all these dips, cul-de-sacs, and cliffs, they know where they are, they know where the efforts and rewards lay, and they make good decisions. So you need to know the dip. You need to know when to stick or quit. Do this, you'll get focused. You'll focus on something that creates a damn lot of value for you and the people around you. And that is certainly what we like to do here on the Moonshots podcast. We love to learn out loud. We love to challenge ourselves to be the best version of ourselves. Okay, that's a wrap. <laughs>